actually preaching from something that I struggle with uh, quite often. But let's let's get into let's get into the the text. Go to Second Kings chapter twenty. This actually comes right out of our Daniel study, which was last Wednesday, and you can catch that on my YouTube channel. Also, the notes from that because we looked all over the place are going to be on on my website, and the link to that will be on the YouTube um, description. But this comes right out of so. So this is leading up to the time of Daniel, in fact. But in my research, I found something very, very interesting. So setting the historical stage, which we did Wednesday as well, this is after King Solomon, which King David and King Solomon, those were good years in Israel. Very good. They were, they were safe. They were very affluent, especially with Solomon. And, they're, and, and uh, they're, they worship God for the most part. Solomon had some struggles with his thousand wives and, and concubines. And with a lot of them, they were foreign women. So along with the foreign women came foreign gods. And Solomon kind of lost his way a little bit. But he came back around at the end. But then his boy, he wrecked it for everybody. Uh, Rehoboam, he was supposed to see. See, God told David that he was, would always have someone um, in David's line on the throne in Israel. But Rehoboam decides he's not going to check with his dad's group of elders that his dad appointed for his son so that he could rule wisely. Instead, Rehoboam went to his little buddies and they all told him what to do because the nation was saying, hey, we're feeling a little oppressed, a little, a little, a little pressed down. We need, we need just a little bit more freedom. And so the elders told Rehoboam, "Hey, give them a little bit more freedom. Your dad was getting a little hard on them, but uh, give them a little more freedom." But the boys said, the boys' club said, "No, you tell them. You think dad was bad? I'm going to be even worse. Enough complaining." So this other fella that wasn't from David's, David's family, Jeroboam, he decides he needs to do something. So he confronts Rehoboam and says, we, we can't live with, with oppression like this. So Jeroboam ends up di dividing. He ends up becoming king of Israel. The nation liked what he was saying and they made him king of Israel. The problem with that is, is God is faithful to his promise. So Rehoboam still got what would be known as South Israel, also known as Judah. That would include Jerusalem and the temple. So that was really the hub of Israel. So that, so that God would be faithful to his promise with David. But now you have a divided kingdom. And so Judah, which is the line of David, South Israel, for 200 years, which leads up to our text in 2 Kings 20, had some good kings who worshiped God and led the country in Judah into worship and some other terrible kings that that straight armed God in fact at one point they lost the book of the law and one of the one of the righteous kings of Judah Josiah he ends up finding it and reinstating a whole bunch of the the, the things in the temple and the priesthood and all the rest of it so Judah wasn't great but it was better than Israel. For 200 years, not one king honored God as their Lord. They worshiped other gods and led the country for 200 years. Look at our country. You know, we started as a Christian nation, but in the last few decades, we've kicked God out of schools, we've kicked God out of, out of workplaces, and now we can't even say Merry Christmas in some places. And that's only been decades. Imagine 200 years of this chaos. That leads us to our text. Now, God, in a few, in about about a hundred years after this, is going to have Babylon come in and discipline Israel, so conquer Israel, and for 70 years, and this was all prophesied, God had it all planned. There's going to be a time limit, but you are as a nation going to be disciplined 
for not acknowledging me as God. It can't go on like this. You are my people. I am your God. I'm going to get your attention. So Babylon's about to come in. Here's, here's the prelude to that. 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 12 to 18. At that time, so starting at verse 12. At that time, Murdoch Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon. It's the first time we hear about Babylon. <laughs> historically, sent Hezekiah. Now, Hezekiah was a righteous king of Judah, so he was doing good. He sent Hezekiah letters and a gift because he had heard of Hezekiah's illness. Hezekiah received the envoys and showed them all that was in his storehouses, silver, the gold, the spices, and the fine olive oil, his armory, and everything found amongst his treasures. There was nothing in his palace or in his all in all his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and asked, What did those men say? Where'd they come from? From a distant land, Hezekiah replied. They came from uh, Babylon. The prophet asked, What'd they see in your palace? They saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. There's nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord, and some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, will be born to you, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Daniel would have been one of them. So this sets the tone for Daniel. This sets the tone for Israel to get spanked. <coughs> Hezekiah lets Babylon in. They're coming, they're coming to, to, Hezekiah was sick, but God gave him another, healed him and gave him another 15 years. And so it, the, the world ended up finding out about this. And, but he lets them in and shows them everywhere. Probably all the secret passages, all the tunnels, and, you know, and now Babylon, Israel's a sitting duck for Babylon. Thanks a lot, Hezekiah. Now, something that you need to know, we're going we're gonna to dig deep this morning. I want you to know you didn't come here for milk, you came here for meat. We're going to eat a big steak today, okay? So, 2 Kings is paralleled to 2 Chronicles. So in your Bible, it's 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. That's, that's right in the middle of your Old Testament. 1 Samuel stands alone. As, as a historical book. 2 Samuel and 1 Kings are parallel. They, they tell the same story. So if you read something in 1 Kings, you want to know more, or 2 Kings, you want to know, no. 1 Kings, you want to know more about it? Go to 2 Samuel, and you can read more about it. <laughs> if you want to read, you read something in 2 Kings, and we did, you can go to 1 and 2 Chronicles to read the same stories. So in my research for a Bible study, I went to 2 Chronicles 32 to read the same story that we just read. Listen to this. He, Hezekiah, succeeded in everything he undertook. But when envoys were sent by the rulers of Babylon to ask him about the miraculous sign, so the healing, that had occurred in the land, listen to this, God left him, left Hezekiah to test him and to know everything that was in his heart. Wow. That just jumped out of the pit. God left him to test him. Whew. From creation, page one of your Bible, God establishes something. He says, in day one, let there be light. Yes. Now, that original Hebrew word, because the Old Testament's written in Hebrew, the, Old Te the New Testament's written originally in Greek. So you want to find out, and we got this junior language called English. So the, the original Hebrew word for light in that day one of creation is a luminary. It's a person of influence. Now that's, that's good because on day four, God says, let there be lights. So that tells it, and that light, that Hebrew word is 
it, well, it's not a light bulb. They didn't have those. It's, it's fire. It's, it's emitting light. Let there be lights in the sky, the, the sun, the stars. And, and uh, of course, there's going to be the ability to light a fire down here so that you can have light. So day one, God originally sets the stage and says, I'm going, sorry, day four, I'm going to do this light and darkness thing. You're going to have light and I'm going to create your eyes so that, so that you need light to be able to come into your eyes so you can see around you. When there is no light, there's going to be darkness and you're not going to see very well. So he says, I'm going to put in the physical an analogy that you're going to wake up with and go to bed with and wake up with and go to bed with that's going to show you what I did in day one. In that obscure darkness, the Holy Spirit is hovering over the waters. God says, let there be light. He's saying, let there be me. Yes. But then he says, so on day four, it's a living analogy of what it will be for you to live with God, His influence, and to live without God, His influence. Light, darkness. Isn't that amazing? God does something else in, in day one. He actually says He separated the light from the darkness. And He called the light day and the darkness night. Now He's not talking about this. He's saying, I'm designing this so that there are going to be times when my presence is going to be. Wow. We kind of had it this morning. A little, he gave us a little taste with that blanket of peace that he brought to me. But I, he says, I'm going to design it. This is day one. That there are going to be times and it's going to seem like I'm absent. That's what he did in day one. We see that right in the garden, where all of a sudden Adam and Eve are having a conversation with Satan. Where's God? He seems to be absent. When God comes back into the picture, he's going, hey guys, where are you? You see, that's by his design. Did God see the conversation between Satan and Eve? Absolutely. Rightly dividing the word, which is what we're told to do, to, to interpret, it, um, interpret it properly, we know that God is omnipresent. But he designed it in a way and, and so that there's going to be times that, he, that he's not going to seem like, like he's left. But we see Hezekiah, he left him to test him, to see all that was in his heart. He left Eve to test her, to see that all of that was in her heart. He left Adam to test him. Is he there? Absolutely he's there. God will never leave. Even Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to show you, first of all, this historical proof that God designed it right from day one, that there's going to be times that he seems here and times that he seems absent. Look at the Psalms. Psalm 13, 1. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Psalm 27. Do not hide your face from me. Psalm 44. Why do you hide your face and forget our misery and oppression? Psalm 69. Don't hide your face from your servant. Answer me quickly, for I am in trouble. Psalm 88. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? You get the picture. Psalm 102, do not hide your face from me when I'm in distress. Turn your ear to me when I call. Answer me quickly. Psalm 147, answer me quickly, Lord. My spirit fails. Don't hide your face from me or I'll be like those who go down to the pit. Go to the end of the book, Revelation. Jesus says in his letter to the church in Philadelphia, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. I am coming soon. But, the, I, but before you ascended into heaven, you said, Lo, I'll be with you always, even to the ends of the age. What do you mean I'm coming soon? He's saying there, hold on, I'm coming soon, because you have the illusion sometimes that I'm not there. Doesn't that make you feel better? Because sometimes, I've been ministering for 30 years, preaching to people, leading people in worship into the presence of God. And sometimes I'll walk around and go, 
Am I on the right track? Right? Like, I love the John the Baptist when he's, when he's the voice in the wilderness and he's saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And he reckoned that here comes, here comes the Messiah right now. Jesus is walking towards, baptizes him. Man, he's a powerhouse. He's in prison later. God seeming a little absent brings his disciples close to the bars and says, go ask Jesus, is he the one or should we be waiting for another? Oh, what? It's so refreshing. There are times when you're going to feel God so close and there's going to be times where you're going to feel like he's absent, maybe non-existent. So what do we do with this? First of all, I want to show you the purpose, what I feel God is, is doing. And I think he knows, as humans, <laughs> familiarity breeds contempt. If he's always there, you'll never miss him. Like eyes, they're desiring the sun when you wake up. It's, it's dark in the morning again, isn't it? So I get up at, at 7 a.m., maybe a little bit before, and the first thing that I've got to do is let my dogs drain the, their tanks. So I'll get up. And I, I just have this, I'll get a little mug of water, I'll go down, I'll open the door, and there they go running, and I'll just stand there. I've, I've been tired lately. And so first thing in the morning, I've got a full day ahead of me, and I know I have nine hours of work ahead of me. And I'm just, I'm, I'm looking over the horizon, through the trees, and I found my eyes were just aching for the sun see the sun. There's no clouds. I know I'm going to see the sun, but I can't even see the crest over the horizon. I'm just aching for the sun. And then those times, well, I get a little emotional, didn't expect this. In the times when I, when I am just going, God, you seem so absent. You know what's happening on the other side of my soul? I'm just aching to see you. That's why. And so instead of regretting that he doesn't feel close, start worshiping him and saying, I can't wait to see you. Familiarity breeds contempt. If it's always light, you'll end up despising the light. Can we just turn the light off for a second? I'm tired. Somebody once said, this is decades ago, and God all of a sudden wrote, I love you, like the stars all of a sudden, I love you, God. Man, to be all over the media, be all over social media, everybody would have their own picture of this, I love you, God. Weeks would go by, months would go by, the sun would go down, you'd look and go, oh, there it is, I love you, God. Years would go by, won't even look up anymore. Start explaining it away. Wonder what happened there. Must have been aliens. You start to despise familiarity, breeds contempt. Here's the other reason God would do this. On day one, see, the Bible tells us that before the foundations of the world, he had ordained for Jesus to come and save us. Yes. Because he knew from the beginning, he's, be he's the beginning and the end. What does that mean? He is the story. He knows the story. He's still walking with Adam and Eve while he's telling John to write down letters to Revelation. While he's at the second coming riding in the, white, the rider on the white horse. My brain can't handle it, but he is all over the history and future of this planet all at the same time. That's true. The world, so he knew this, and so he designed it right from day one to say there's going to be times that you feel on there and times that I feel, you'll feel like I'm absent. And it's because the world is fallen. Out here is sin. 
the world is groaning from sin. <clears throat> sin is the rejection of God. God cannot function in rejection. And so where does he need to be? He needs to be at a protected, holy, and righteous place. In the Old Testament, that was the tabernacle, the temple. He wasn't in the outer court. He wasn't in the inner court. He wasn't even in the holy place. He was in the most holy place, right in the center, protected by all that rejection. Now where is he? You protect the presence of God from all of this. But of course, you know, I've told this story many times, but it relates so well here. I remember pacing in the sanctuary of my old church, just pacing because my life was, was crumbling all over. My home was crumbling all. Ministry was growing, was going through the roof, but my home was struggling. I remember pacing, going, God, I just want to see you. I want, you know, we were saying it today. I want to feel you. I could use a hug right now. I really love to hear you. And I just felt the Holy Spirit the sweet, still, small voice say, yeah, the flesh wants to be fed. Because all of that is flesh. And God doesn't want to meet us out here, out where he has the tension of rejection. He wants to meet us where he's safe. He created safety by the blood of Jesus. Not by your merit, not by your actions, obviously. But he's safe in here. But because it's in here and we function as believers, we, we want to function in the spirit. We want to walk by faith. We want to walk in the spirit. But we have these, these five senses that we also need to function out here. So when we're functioning out here, he's not going to seem very close. But when we're functioning in here, taking time aside, to hear that still small voice, to be still and know, and all of a sudden, The world is falling. He's going to seem absent. God, Jesus said to the woman at the well, A time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So they're the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. You're seeking Him? Well, let's turn the tables. You want Him to seek you? Worship Him. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and truth. And I've already alluded to this, so God knows that familiarity breeds contempt. The world has fallen, and so he wants to meet with us spirit and the spirit and deep on the deep. That can make us feel a little wanting sometimes uh, because we, we do function in the physical, but he also wants to build our faith. Faith isn't what you feel or what you think. Faith isn't what you feel and isn't what you think. It's what you know. Or well, isn't what I think what I know? No, not always. Because what you think comes from experience, comes from, from the things that you've read, comes from there. But what you know comes from here. And there's a big cavern between what you think and what you know. God left him to test him and to know everything that was in his heart. When God leaves you, that's when your faith needs to kick in to hide gear. You don't prove faith when the prayers are answered. You don't prove faith when God's manifest presence just comes upon you and you get the shivers and you go, oh God, there you are, oh Lord, you're just amazing. That's not faith. Faith is when you're walking around going, I don't know where you are, but I believe that you are. Yes. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. 
<laughs> so let, let's talk faith. Let's talk not what we think and what we feel, but let's talk about what we know. God sees. He left him to test him, but he still saw him. <laughs> Psalm 10, why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Arise, Lord, lift up your hand, O God. Do not forget the helpless. Why does the wicked man revile God? Why does he say to himself, he won't call me to account? But you, God. You know all those psalms that I wrote, why you're hiding your face from me? They are, they are completely absorbed by, but I know that you're there. But I worship you, king of all kings, almighty God. They're just, and then there's a line, why are you hiding your face from me? It's that human element, but this is how, you, it's not what you feel, it's not what you think, it's what you know, and you declare what you know. And here's the psalmist after saying, Lord, why do you stand far off? Why are wicked people prospering and not me? And then verse 14, that's, so that's what he thinks, but verse 14 is what he knows. But you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. That's what he knows. So God sees, even when you don't, he sees you walking around going, where are you? Where are you? In fact, uh, I remember with my daughter Jordan, and it was her first day of junior kindergarten. And she was going to take the bus because the school was too far to walk. She's going to take the bus. So I took her to the bus stop. Got her little backpack. Her first day of school outfit on. And on the bus she goes. Little wave. Little tear. <laughs> Me. And, and uh, off goes the bus. I'm waving. As soon as I'm out of view of the bus, I run to my truck and I drive to the school. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, 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 I'm making sure that she gets off the bus. That she's chaperoned into the school. I see all those things. Dad left me at the corner. Oh no, he didn't. And God being all, all omnipresent and everywhere at all times and intimately dealing with eight billion people all at the same time. It makes my brain explode, but he sees. Yes. He knows. The other thing that we know from our Bible is that God is love. All of his motivations and actions all of them are love. Even he left me to test me, to see everything that was in. Hezekiah needed to see what was in his heart. Isaiah comes in and rebukes him, and Isaiah, Hezekiah ends up repenting. But he needed to know that there was a nasty pride in his heart. And it's that moment if he left me to test me. God does it. All of his motivations and all of his actions are love. Ephesians 3, 17. 17 and 19 and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and I love this line and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that's ridiculous talk how can I know something that surpasses knowledge it's because I don't know, it's not what I think, it's not what I feel, it's what I know. That's faith. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That's all attached to knowing His love. All the fullness of God is attached to knowing His love. And the last point that we know is God never leaves. Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. There's nowhere to escape God's presence even if you want to. remember I had, a, I had a season that was in my apartment on 
Riverview Drive. It was on the seventh floor, and it overlooked a big part of town. It faced east. The sunrise. Boy, I saw some nice sunrises. I remember I woke up before the sun was up, and I was just overwhelmed by the presence of God. That doesn't happen very often in the morning. <laughs> And, and, I, and I walked out onto the, God sent me out on the balcony and I was just standing there. And, and I had my hands raised. And just as I raised my hands, the crest of the sun started to come over the horizon. And I thought, wow. And so I just, I, I, without any words, maybe there is the on here, amazing, you're awesome, but I kept my hands up. <clears throat> now above the horizon, there was clear sky. And above the clear sky, there was clouds that went right over my apartment. So it was right from the horizon. So there was a little bit. It was going to be a cloudy day. And I felt the Lord say, keep your hands up while the sun appears and then disappears. So I see the sun. Wow. And it's full. Full for about five minutes. And all of a sudden, it began to disappear. And as soon as it disappeared into the clouds for the day, I put my hands down. I felt the Lord say, where's the sun? He says, we're behind the clouds. He said, where's the light? It's all around me. The times that God doesn't seem close. Look around you. All creation declares the invisible qualities of God can be clearly seen in all of creation. You'll see him reflect off of people who believe in him, who love him. But God sees, God loves you, and he is aware.